Hello Guardians, Lord Bojax here. If you haven't heard of me, it's not too surprising. I actually just started my YouTube channel recently, but I come to you all as a Destiny community member that's been around here for since near the launch of Destiny 1. And I've been playing D1 and D2 for a good part of coming up on three years now. But this is going live just as ahead of the launch of Curse of Osiris, which is, this is Sunday, so it's coming out on Tuesday. But admittedly, I've had to go through quite a lot of reflection on my experiences with Destiny 1 in this game. My name is Bipe, had to go through a similar reflection, but this is not an attempt to copy him. This is my personal experience that I'm going to be bringing to you all, because I wanted to put this out there. So... To start with, I'm going to talk about my experience with Destiny 1 because trying to cram that and my experience with this game in the same video is going to be too much. It may take two videos to do Destiny 1. I'm not sure. We'll find out. So if you don't, so I'm going to be playing this game live while I'm going through my thoughts. So my apologies if you hear any button clacking. I hope it's not too distracting for you. So, let's start here. So, I guess my story with Destiny begins with when the game first launched. I didn't have a PS4 at the time. And I had friends in college who, and other people in my class that, they got this game, they got Destiny 1. Because it was, you, anyone knows at this point how heavily hyped it was. Well, all I kept hearing from most people was that how much of a disappointment it was. And how it tried too, too much to be like Borderlands, but failed in every department. All Everybody had the same opinion except for one of my best friends who I... I still speak to him to this day and get his opinions on things. He quite liked the game, but he felt it was too short for his taste. And that it needed a lot of work. But he had faith in the game and that it would be better. Me, I had no idea what what to expect coming into it, so. Fast forward to January of 2015. I had just gotten a PS4. My birthday was coming up. And my mother, bless her heart, she, she took me out for birthday shopping and she got me Destiny 1. And after all the stories I heard, I had some trepidations going into it. I was like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to like this. I mean, I liked, Bo I loved Borderlands, but I didn't know if this was the kind of experience I was going to like. But she got it for me, and I wasn't going to turn it down. So I started playing it, and this was just the vanilla version. Dark Below had already come out in December, but I didn't buy the expansion pass or anything. I just wanted to see the vanilla game. And... When I was playing it straight away, I did fall in love with the gunplay. I feel I fell in love with it. I liked how everything felt. I loved the idea of these playing as a space wizard. But where I had my main issue was with the way the plot of the game was handled. Now, I'll talk a little bit more about plot versus narrative in a moment, because there's a difference. The plot bugged me greatly. Because it just, to me, it felt shallow and just wasn't there. But what kept me going was the gameplay, which I've always asserted with most games that gameplay is more important than the plot, because that's part of what keeps you engaged. But there comes a point, too, when if your plot's just shallow or just not there, it becomes a real distraction. And it was a distraction. I went through the vanilla campaign with quite little fanfare. I mean, I wasn't wowed by really any of it. So, I was like, okay, well, I'll just try to get to max level. And see how things go. And then, I didn't even know about the raid, the Vault of Glass, when I finished the campaign. I didn't even know about it. Until later.
And I was probably like level 25 at that point when I finally discovered the vault, but then I found out I was still too weak. And so I watched some videos on the vault and then I was amazed at how complex the activity was. I was like, I was like, wow, you actually have to put some effort into this. There's some actual challenge here, some mechanical complexity. It, it kind of, in a way, it made me think of uh, Dark Souls. Because I love challenging games and hardcore games. And the vault appealed to me, but the, I was too weak to do it. I tried to keep leveling up, but it was kind of, I was still running on the vanilla version, which it was being a real pain for me to level up. So, I, you know, I looked at my case. I saw where advertised the expansion pass, and I was like, well... I had two thoughts. Was Dark Below's plot better? And second, could I level up a little bit faster? So, I ultimately took the leap and bought the expansion pass. I said, well, I'll give it to House of Wolves and see how this goes. So, I played through the through the Dark Below campaign, which I was very surprised at how much of, like, they actually gave a central antagonist to it. I mean, for the first mission was fairly underwhelming with, with Sardon, the Fist of Crota, but when they introduced Omnigul during the Siege of the War Mine, I was like, I was like, oh, 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 a villain? What? And then the next mission, we go to the will to the uh, moon to the to destroy Crota's soul and I was like I get there and I'm like oh my goodness a proper final boss what this is more of a final boss fight than the uh, black garden was what in the world but I was disappointed with how short the campaign ended up being but I couldn't argue with some of the gear I was receiving I got Murmur, I got Armor that brought my light up some more. I got about level 26, I believe. So it's like, okay, I'm kind of liking the Dark Below stuff. This is cool. I'm, I'm liking what I'm seeing, but I realized I was far away off from Crota. But I did have... I did have Vault to look forward to, so I got to level 27... And before I went to do that, I was like, oh, I'm going to go do the Nightfall for one, for the first time. And when I went to do my first Nightfall, that is where I met the first member person to join my formal fire team. You know, we went on patrol. We talked for a good two to three hours while we were patrolling, and I was, we were working on public events to get Vanguard marks. At the time that you could do that. Eventually we were we both got to level 28 before we finally managed to get a team together to go raid the vault. Which it was in that moment I met some of the other members of my fire team I still play with to this day. We, we all played through the vault. It was kind of our first experience. And we enjoyed the hell out of it. I mean, we have particularly fond memories of doing the jumping puzzle for the first time and a bunch of us falling to our death and we're just hysterically laughing at each other as we watch each other fail. But it took many hours that week we tried it, but we finally beat the vault. Oh, we were so happy with ourselves. So then we made the goal, we said, oh, we're going to go to Crota's Inn when we get the chance. So, a couple weeks pass, we get leveled up, and we go to Crota, and... We ended up having some more experienced people take some of us through it. Which, I quite like Crota's End actually, because that ended up being my favorite raid in Destiny 1. Probably much to the amazement of some. I just loved the 
action-oriented set pieces of Crota and how everything looked and... And then what is... You could have hero moments where one person could save an encounter. And then my absolute favorite thing was finding ways to defeat the different parts of the raid with minimum fire team members. You know, jumping the abyss, jumping the bridge. I wasn't one of those people that pulled their router on Crota, by the way. I was a good boy. Granted, it took our fire team a long time to figure out how to beat Crota ourselves. Three weeks of trying, in my, to my recall, to my recollection. But we finally did it, and we beat him consistently. We got to max level. But there was one thing that still bugged us, that for as much as we loved Crota's End, and some of the stuff that Dark Bolo brought, especially with some of the quests that they introduced, like hunting down Omnigul, which her strike, I liked quite a lot. Because it, it was built up to quite extensively. And then the Urn of Sacrifice, where you perform almost this satanic ritual from the Hive. But... They ended up removing Urn of Sacrifice at a later date, which was unfortunate. But, needless to say, we were looking forward to House of Wolves because we wanted to see if there were any more improvements. Well, they delayed it, we had to wait till May. So, House of Wolves comes, and I remember the first day vividly. Because I was at work at the time. And it was probably it was either hour or hour and a half before I was supposed to leave. Thank you, Guardian. My phone goes off and it's a message from my good from my good fr friend and fire teammate Dorian. And he said, when are you going to get home? And I said, reply back, uh, why? I said, well, it's about another hour. Why? He said, you need to play this. You're going to love it. So, I get back. I get home. I come online and they say, get on the game right now. A couple, Dory and someone else, I forget who it was at the time, they, they ended up waiting after the first story mission for me to show up. Whereas, my first fire teammate, Shotgun, and his cousin, they, they both play, kept on going through the story. But I played that first mission in House of Wolves and visited the Reef, which I fell in love with Varix, by the way, at first sight. Yeah, I'll never get enough of his, yes... Give me your ghost. But I play through the I do the reef, I play through the first mission of House of Wolves, and I'm just like Holy shit. This is this is pretty good. Witty banter between Varix and Petra. Heavy armored vehicles, a boss fight with a walker as the first enemy, fighting Skolos at the very beginning of, of the expansion, giving you an antagonist to look towards defeating the whole way and then he, the best part of all getting the Vestian dynasty at the end of that mission a sidearm the first to be in the game I loved that sidearm it was just a pity that when it became the Queen's Choice it got nerfed some but fantastic Just that first mission was fantastic. It, it got a little. It got a little. How should I say? More run of the mill to, for the next few couple missions, but. Another thing I will never forget is being in the mission right before where the Wolf Baron's talking with the King Barons and you have to go in and just kill them all. Well, while we were doing that. Shotgun and his cousin made it to the next mission after that, and all I can remember then was screaming out, Why are we in the vault? And we're on the other end going, What? Yeah, we're going into the vault. 
we're like, oh, well, that's cool. We didn't think much of it. We're just like, oh, that's cool. They're using the vault. But then we're finishing up the king's mission, and all of a sudden we hear them scream out, why are the oracles here? On my team, we our minds were blown. We were like, wait, the oracles are now regular enemies? We're like, this is awesome! So then we did the mission ourselves and we're like, we were like, yes! This is fantastic! Yeah, we played the vault mission, we loved it, but then it still wasn't over because then we stood to chase Skolas to the Terminus, which... I had already glitched into the Terminus before the expansion came out and got to see what it looked like in its newest incarnation. And all we could think of is, oh, the implications. But Shotgun and his cousin, they made it to the... They made it to Skolos before we did, obviously, because they were ahead of us. And they defeated him pretty quickly, and we did as well when we caught up to him. So we we're like, oh, you know, that's a pity that he was so easy to beat. But then, but that was done on purpose because then we found out that you had to go to the prison and fight him. The prison of elders, which unlocked after the campaign. And, but we didn't do that first. We went and did Tannix the Scarred, which we ended up liking too, by the way. But we played the prison, and. We loved the Prison of Elders. I mean, it was a little bit of a, a a poor man's horde mode, but we enjoyed it. Granted, we thought some of the bosses were a little ridiculous, like Kodron Gatelord. That boss could just go to hell. Even to this day, he's a bit of a he's a pain to fight. But we just loved every minute of just Varix announcing the whole thing. It's just like, yes, just mental minds, yes, so you die. <laughs> and I'll never forget to the first time we made it down to the treasure room. Because we were like, oh my god, where did he get all this gold? But we played Prison. We didn't do Skolos the first week. It was going to be too much on us. But what we did end up doing was lots of Wolf Prowls. And we enjoyed the shit out of the Wolf Prowls. Kill a bunch of Fallen. Kill a boss. Find a chest. Open it. Get lots of loot. Oh, we, we were in love with that. Especially when you could do the Skywatch exploit. Where you could just keep entering and exiting... Skywatch and keep opening the chest. That was fantastic. We did eventually go fight Skolos, which we fought him before they made all the adjustments to his fight where he couldn't summon adds infinitely, they lowered his health a bunch. But we did beat him before they made the changes, and it was not pleasant. Which, we hated that fight with a passion. But when they made all the changes, we went back and redid the fight, and then we ended up loving it. It ended up being one of the best boss fights in the game up to that point. Just a pure battle of attrition with Skolos. But... Once we were finished with House of Wolves, which we were appalled at how quickly you could get to max light, we did try the Trials, which we it wasn't our cup of tea, so we're mainly PvE people. We do play Iron Banner, but that's about it. But we did end up having a bit of a falling out about halfway through House of Wolves. Shotgun and his cousin, they played Iron Banner, which this was the time Iron Banner cheating was really bad. Well, that made them angry and they just discarded the whole game and we never saw them again. 
which that was a shame because that fractured our fire team going into the Taken King. Which, that was disappointing. But, by that point, we had successfully figured out how to run Crota's End with as few people as possible. We had it down to where you could do it with two people. And, I did take the opportunity, like, a couple months before the Ticking King to... Have somebody help me get flawless in trials. Just because I wanted to say I'd done it once and it was done and dusted, I didn't have to do it again. But then we started getting stuff for the Taken King. They revealed the new subclasses, they revealed the new plot with Oryx. And needless to say, we were kind of skeptical to start with. Because we're like, well, House of Wolves did improve the plot considerably. I've spotted another Cabal mining expedition. Guardian, you know the drill. Yeah, they improved the plots significantly in House of Wolves, so we were wondering if that would transpose to Taken King. And then we started seeing all the different publications about how they played through a good part of the campaign, all the new systems that were in place, like the they called it transmogrification at the time, but it ended up becoming infusion later. But they talked about that, the additions to the tower, the improved the improved narrative even over House of Wolves. Cade getting a, an upgrade in his character. It was it was quite something to look at all this positive press, which we were kept our eyes on Game Informer for quite a while while they were putting all this stuff up. Eventually, finally, we were just convinced, like, okay, we'll give House of Wolves a chance. Or not House of Wolves, uh, Taken King. I don't know why I repeated myself. Um, so we we shelled out the, the $40 or our regional equivalents, basically because a couple, a couple more in the UK. And we patiently waited. We kept it out on... We did take a bit of a break, to my recollection, before death, before Taken King, because Metal Gear and the like had Metal Gear Solid Five had just come out, and among other things. So we took some, we took a break. But man, oh man, when Taken King came out, man, that changed our opinion on Destiny One for the rest of its duration. Man, oh man. But, I think that my story for the Ticking King may have to wait, because I already know, so I've already spent almost over a little over 20 minutes just talking about the first year of Destiny 1. So, I think Destiny 1 talk is going to have to continue on the next one. So, as soon as I'm finished with this public event, I'm going to... Back out and cut it off. But I'll say, if you hung in for this first part, thank you for listening, and there'll be more to come very shortly. Yeah, I'll talk about the Taken King and Rise of Iron the next time. And as I return to orbit here, with that, I will leave you all there and. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll catch you for part two of this.